Well, good morning, ZPC. It is good to be here with you this morning, and also uh, good morning to those of you who are able to watch us from your own home uh, today on our live stream, and what a blessing it is to be here with each and every one of you. What an amazing last few days this has been weather-wise, am I right? And people say there's nothing good about 2020. Look at this autumn. So uh, it's been beautiful so far, and it is beautiful to be able to be here with you all this morning. Just a couple of things as we kick off, just to uh, let you know. First of all, as we kind of get into these new habits, um, if you want a bulletin, um, please uh, click on the QR code, take a, a picture of that, and that should allow you to, uh, to be able to see the bulletin. It also will allow you to check in online. Uh, and so to say that you are here, and if you're new, then you can uh, uh, please let us know that. We would love to be able to welcome you in a way that is good and appropriate and hospitable. So. Let me also just remind you all a few of the, uh, of the kind of the rules that we have. Uh, rules is not a great word. Um, can you think of a different one? Guidelines. Guidelines so much better. Guidelines um, that we have. Uh, thank you last week, by the way, for doing such a great job of following those guidelines. Asking you to keep your mask on uh, as soon as the service is over. Uh, if you could please go out. It's a beautiful day this week, so you can certainly, or this time, so you can certainly go out into the, uh, the little horseshoe area. That's our kind of nod to the Colts. And you can uh, hang outside out there um, and get to know some folks and just get to see some people. So I encourage you to do that. And then finally, of course, uh, just, to, just thinking through the singing. I know that this has been kind of a struggle for many of our folks who, are, who love to sing, as I I do as well, and uh, and so we've you know we've decided to kind of take the, uh, a safer route on this one because of the aerosols that go. We don't need to get into all of that um, uh, because, quite frankly, just thinking about it is kind of gross. So, but here is here's what I want you guys to know: a couple of things as we continue to think about this. One is, first of all, I'm so delighted when people miss singing. Uh, I think that's a wonderful thing, and it's this great reminder, right, of how important singing is to us. Secondly, I want to encourage you to sing at home. Um, and probably many of you already do, but um, with our family, we oftentimes, we have our Alexa, um, and we, uh, we get Hillsong United on our Pandora station, and all of a sudden, all of us just begin to sing. Sometimes we even break out and dance. If you walk by, you might be able to see that at some point. It's quite the show, and so uh, I encourage you to do that. Uh, I also encourage you to hum. Uh, you can certainly hum in here, and that is fine as well. Um, finally, I was in conversation with somebody with a ZPC or and she um, uh, kind of gave me this quote that I thought was really helpful by Derek Prince. It says, Worship is not singing hymns or choruses. Worship is not a declaration of God's attributes. Vocal expression has to do with praise and thanksgiving, which is wonderful. But worship has more to do with attitude. Worship is a heart bowed low in God's presence. So what I would encourage you to do is during this season, as we aren't kind of, um, as we aren't singing, I would encourage you to think about your own heart and your own attitude. Uh, worship is about coming together before God and before one another and remembering all that God has done. And with joy, we express with our hearts this sense that God is God, that we are not, uh, and it's a celebration simply of the fact of how beautiful and holy God is. So I invite you during this season to remember that as you come in today. And so with that, let us worship God. Come, let us worship. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. Yeah. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven. You conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great Faith. 
faithful forevermore. You have done great things. Hasn't he? Yes, he has. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You have done great things. Oh, God, you, you will do great things. for the things he's done and we also praise him for who he is we're going to read from Revelation 5 together it says then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice we say together who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scrolls or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll in seven seals. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain and by your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Y'all can have a seat. Do you wish? 
wish that you could see it all made new. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. to be the light within our midst, it is, is it good that we remind ourselves of this, is anyone worthy, is anyone whole, is anyone able to bring the seal and open the scroll. The Lion of Judah who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? truly love us he does. does the spirit move among us he does. and does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those he loves he does does our God intend to dwell again Let us now go together to, to, uh, to God in prayer. Heavenly Father and most holy God, we praise your name forever. You are the God of all the seasons that turn and fill us with awe over your creation, the God of health and community and prosperity, which we know flows abundantly upon all who seek comfort in you. You are the God of the whole space-time continuum that stretches out far past human understanding. We are as blades of grass. We are as grasshoppers hopping about the blades of grass, chirping loudly and proudly, yet only for the briefest of seasons and forever always held close to you. 
God, forgive us for our lack of an eternal perspective, for our selfish, self-centered, and self-absorbed natures that turn from your glory and neglect the service and love that you call us to enact unto all of your children. We confess that we have indulged in judgment, in anger, in apathy, in fear. We have ignored your calls for unity, for service, for justice, and for lavishing love upon all of our neighbors. Thank you so much for your never-ending patience with us and for your all-encompassing forgiveness of our numerous sins. You promise redemption and reconciliation through the sacrifice of your precious Son, Jesus Christ, whose blood may washes us clean so that we may enjoy the comfort of your presence, freed from the shame and the guilt and the anxiety of our failures. The good news has spread to billions and spreads far and wide and brings us in joy and community with saints both living and dead. God, we know that you are the God of small things and large things, so we ask that you hear our prayers knowing that you are listening. We pray for Ada. We pray that you are, uh, we praise you for giving her healing. We pray for Adrian Boo. We pray that you lavish upon her your healing. We pray for Gary Koval and that you walk with him in the comfort and in his grief over the loss of his mother. We pray for all these things and for all of us, both here at home and around the world as we face truly daunting anxiety and fear in this time. We know that you hear us, we know that you are with us, and we praise you and bless you and look to you and for guidance. And you have given us the community and the love that we can now come together and say the prayer that your son Jesus Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. I am also doing the announcements. Give me a sec. All right. Uh, before we transition into our worship and our sermon today, some things to keep in mind. First of all, uh, the community assistance ministry team is looking for individuals to serve. If that is something that you are called to do, you can contact Christy Tharp. The Mi Mission Action Committee, or MAC, would like to hear about any opportunities uh, that you know of to reach out to the world around us. If you know of ways that we can better serve our community both here and abroad, contact Gary Ball. If you are unable to make it into our building on Sunday mornings, we would love you to join us at our 8 o'clock or 9.30 a.m. for a live stream service. Our tech team has been working very hard to offer that, so like everybody, let's give them some praise for that right now. Just, oh my gosh, so much work. Uh, in order to partake in that, you just need to visit zpclive.org. The week's recorded services and sermons and ser sermon audio will be available at 11 a.m. each Sunday on our website. Thank you so much for your continued generous gifts to ZPC, especially during this difficult time. You can continue to give in so many ways. First of all, zpc.org slash give, or you can go to the Church Life app, or you can text ZPC to the number 73256, or you can write a check and put it in the mail, or if you are blessed to join us physically in the building, there are um, boxes right next to the doors on the way out of the sanctuary. Thank you so much again for joining us, however you may do so. And now let us listen to a fabulous sermon.
of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song and sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount I'm fixed upon it mount of thy Interposed his precious blood. That was beautiful. Thank you for leading us in worship this morning. And you know, before I dive in today, um, I, I realized after the 9:30 service last week, I forgot to tell you where Pastor Scott is. Pastor Scott, unfortunately, a couple times now has been exposed to someone with COVID. Actually, a couple people, and so he is in isolation uh, during this time. And so he just wanted to. Let you all know that he's been very sorry to not be here last week or, or this Sunday, and he probably won't be here next Sunday either, unfortunately. So, uh, so please continue to pray for the Shelton family, uh, and so we will, uh, we will look forward uh, to seeing him uh, and all the Sheltons when they return. Um, before I kind of talk about the scripture passage today, uh, we're continuing in our sermon series on flourishing in the wilderness, and... Um, you know, we, last week we talked about Luke. We kind of moved forward and looked at Jesus uh, and the three temptations in the wilderness. And so we're back uh, again with the Israelites. But I want to just say a couple things just to remind you. Maybe you've missed the whole, maybe you haven't been here at all for the series. Um, if you want a quick synopsis, basically, you know, you got the Israelites. They're freed from slavery. They go to, you know, they're out of Egypt. Um, you know, God tells them, hey, you are my beloved children. You know, you are my, you, you are mine. Just follow me. Trust me. And the Israelites struggle with trusting God. And uh, they're concerned God's not going to give them food to, dr to eat or water to drink, and so they're continually struggling, and they don't trust very well, but God continues to forgive them. And so we've been on this kind of this real tumultuous journey, but now, now they are on the doorstep of Canaan, which is the promised land. So after all of this meandering, all these struggles, they are now right there, right there. They can almost touch it. In fact, 12 of them do touch it. These are 12 spies that God says, hey, I want you all, take one from every tribe, so basically a representative from all of Israel, to go over for 40 days into the promised land. See what you can see. 
So they do, and they see people, and, and they, they see the different tribes, and, uh, and they see a lot of fruit. I mean, a lot of fruit. And not just a lot of fruit. It's big fruit. In fact, honestly, every time I think about these, I remember my childhood. Whenever I think about the 12 spies, what I always remember are the grapes. You see this picture here? This is what I remember. And so, I don't know, maybe I just had a Sunday school teacher who really loved grapes, but this was what was emphasized, that they were some massive grapes, right? In fact, you know, they name it after all the fruit, right? And there's also some figs and some pomegranates, but that's not what they talk about nearly as much as the massive grapes. And so they come back after having been there for 40 days, and they are about to make their report to all of the Israelites, which takes us to 1325, um, verse 25, through the 10th verse of the 14th chapter. And that's what I'm going to read for us this morning. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the Israelites in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. I told you a lot about fruit. They told him, we came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Yet the people who live in the land are strong, and the towns are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb who was one of the spies, he quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we. So they brought to the Israelites an unfavorable report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land that we have gone through as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the peoples that we saw in it are of great size. There we saw the Nephilim. The Anakites come from the Nephilim. And to ourselves we seemed like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become booty. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us choose a captain and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the Israelites. And Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the Israelites, The land that we went through as spies is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are no more than bread for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But the whole congregation threatened to stone them. Sisters and brothers in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and let us pray. God, we pray that you would be with us this morning. In the time of fear and anxiety, that you would be our peace. And we pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen and amen. If you were here last week or if you listened online, you heard me talk at least briefly about fear and anxiety and the realities that we can uh, easily give in to those things in this time and place. It certainly seems like fear and anxiety are running rampant. It's one of the reasons why I feel like Numbers 13 and 14, of which I just read a portion, is a real gift 
to us. Uh, for one, it's a gift to us because of the fact that when we read it, we realize that fear and anxiety have always been around. It's easy. At times I see myself doing this where I think, well, this is either the first time that we've endured this or must be the worst time. But when you begin to read about how thousands of years ago, clearly they were continuing to wrestle with fear and anxiety, you realize, well, this has just always, in some sense, been a part of what we do as humans. Another thing, though, it seems to me that's helpful about Numbers 13 and 14 is the simple fact that I think oftentimes it's very difficult for us to know how much fear and anxiety is shaping us. It, it feels like it's almost in the water right now. And, and, and so it would be very easy for us to not even realize just how we are constantly living with a certain amount of fear or anxiety. And, and sometimes the easiest way for you to begin to see how it is changing and distorting you is to be able to look at somebody else and see how it is changing and distorting them. And that's certainly one of the things that we see going on in Numbers 13 and 14. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. But before we do, I, I do think it's also important for us to realize that fear is simply a part of the human journey, but it's certainly a part of being on mission for God. That there are going to be fearful things when you are on mission without question. I love the way that the Israelites, or excuse me, that the spies kind of talk about this because they say, hey, look, this is a, this is a place full of lots of great fruit. There's, it's amazing. It flows with milk and honey. This place is incredible. Yet, the people are big. The cities are strong and they're fortified. It's important for us to know that it's not one or the other. It's not like, well, you're either in the promised land or you're living in fear. The reality is, is that there are going to be fearful things as you follow God, as you continue to go towards God's kingdom. I, I like what John Ortberg says. He says this. He says, fear and growth go together like macaroni and cheese. Who doesn't love macaroni and cheese? It's a packaged deal. Who doesn't love packaged macaroni and cheese? The decision to grow always involves a choice between risk and comfort. This means that to be a follower of Jesus, you must renounce comfort as the ultimate value of your life. In other words, there are going to be fearful things that come along with when you are asked to take steps towards God, to follow God, there will be moments of fear. And let's be clear, we should do it with wisdom. Fear should make us be wise in many ways. In other words, if you were those spies, what you shouldn't have done is just walked into Canaan, right? Walked into one of those fortified cities and just been like, hey, I think we'll put the TV right here, the sofa right here, the coffee table there, and act like you're just going to walk in there with no problem. There will always be struggles. So we need to be wise, but we also need to be keenly aware of the way in which fear, aware of the way in which fear and anxiety are almost always, if we allow them to, are going to begin to take over and control and distort things. So let's think about this. Dennis Olson points out, kind of talks about the different ways that the people are described. In verses 22 through 24 of the 13th chapter, I didn't read it, but it just kind of lists the, the, the people, the list of different tribes, and, and then it lists the, the, the fruit. And what's interesting, of course, again, is that, is that what was mentioned or, or, or what they named that land after wasn't the big people, when they were there, what they most noticed was the big grapes, the big fruit, the pomegranates, the figs, right? That was really the thing. And then over time, as they come back and they begin to describe the people, well, it gets a little bit bigger then, right? The people all of a sudden, well, you know, you got to realize that these people, they're, they're kind of big as we keep thinking about this a little bit more. And then when Caleb says, well, guys, we got this. You know, the Lord's on our side. We can do this. Don't worry about it. All of a sudden, then, the people become massive. In fact, did you notice all of a sudden, they're like, all the people are big, and the Nephilim are there. The Nephilim were a mythical people. They were half God, half human. And so all of a sudden then, now whether or not they're saying they're actually half God, half human, or whether they're just trying to say they are as big as them, it's not really important. What's important to see is how this fear begins to grow and how all of a sudden the obstacles grow larger and larger and larger until it's almost like there's no way that you could do it. Have you seen the size of these people? You ever had that? 
When there's an obstacle that's a month away, it seems like not that big of a deal, but every day as you get closer, it gets bigger and bigger. But not only does the fear and anxiety, not only does it make everything else bigger, did you hear how they then began to describe themselves? And they're giants, and, and we're, we're grasshoppers. All of a sudden, their ability and who they are becomes smaller and smaller until they're, you know, we're, we're just those little grasshoppers. I have, I have a few friends uh, whom I love but who they seem to have no real confidence in their own gifts. I've seen them do this where they're, they're, they're going to start some new venture or some new project. And yet, when they begin to describe these things, all of a sudden you begin to hear them say, well, I don't know. I'm not, I don't, I'm not that good. I'm not sure I can really do this anymore. What was I thinking? I mean, look, at they're, they're much better than I am. Right? It's almost inevitable, this, this fear and anxiety, right? All of a sudden, everything else is massive, and I'm just the smallest thing, the most incapable thing ever. And so the spies report, 10 of the 12 spies, I should say, is not a good report. And so the people of Israel, we could have guessed this, right? What do they say? Of course, you know, as soon as this happens, they're like, oh, let's go back to Egypt. Right? And we talked about this several weeks ago now when we were outside. We talked about the fact that, you know, it, it distorts your opinion of the past. All of a sudden, the past becomes glorious, even though they were slaves. They can't wait to get back there. But not only does this distort the past, it also obviously distorts their view of God. Right? Because now God, oh, God's God. He seems bent on killing us. That's the reason he brought us here, just to let us die. Our wives, our children, oh, they're just going to be like treasure. They're just going to, you know, for somebody else. Now, here's the thing. Listen, pay, l listen to this. They are on the doorstep. They can see the promised land. How easy could it have been for them to have sat there and said, wait a second, guys, there it is. Remember? Remember how we were slaves in Egypt and God came and that crazy Moses and they cleared us of that crazy uh, Pharaoh and then all the, I almost said Pharisee, Pharaoh and, and, then, and, then, and then we thought we were sunk because of the Red Sea and God opened up the Red Sea and we got through the Red Sea. That was incredible. And then we were like, oh, we're so hungry. We're never going to eat. And boom, there was manna and then all of a sudden there was quail and then we thought we were going to drink but all of a sudden there's water and oh man, we, did, we, we kept disobeying. But God kept forgiving us and now can you believe it? Listen to this. We're, there's the promised land. Whoa! But they didn't. Guess he just wants to kill us. What's God done for us? Instead, they focus on the fearful future rather than on what God had done for them. But it's also interesting that they step up their Egypt talk this time. Because did you notice what else they said, which was, you know what we need? We need a captain. Let's find ourselves a captain. If we could just find a captain to take us back, then we'd be okay. I think it's real interesting. If you look over the history of the world and you look at tyrants, dictators, what you almost always notice is that the, the soil has been cultivated for them to take over. And that soil is almost always fear and anxiety. That when people get afraid, they become desperate, and they begin to believe that all they need is one person, a captain, usually a male, not always, but usually a charismatic male, who says, I will answer every question and every fear that you have. And they begin to put a disproportionate amount of hope and trust in that person. It happens in the church. Most every time that you can see a pastor who, who abuses his or her power, it almost always comes out of a sense of fear from the people, and they begin to put a disproportionate amount of hope and trust in a particular person, a pastor in this case. When you scratch the surface, fear and anxiety will cause you to begin to distort things, to exaggerate things, to forget God, and to begin to put way too much trust in one person. To solve everything for you. 
Now at this point, Moses and Aaron, the leaders, Joshua and Caleb, the spies who wanted to keep moving forward, they are despondent. They're despondent that the Israelites seem to have no desire to help at all, no desire to move forward. And so they begin to fall on their faces. They begin to tear their clothes. Joshua and Caleb beg them, please, please, just pay attention. Please, we can do this. The Lord will do this. But they seem to not be able to listen. Again, we talked about this. Ed Friedman said that, that when people are anxious and fearful, it's very difficult for them to be able to hear because they're running away. But I think what's also interesting about this particular passage is that they're not just afraid, or they don't just, they, they, it's not that they just can't hear, it's that they actually don't want to. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that, that fear and anxiety can almost be addictive. So much so that you don't want to hear anybody that might offer any sense of joy or peace or hope. I was reading something earlier this week that was, quite frankly, very convicting to me. I, uh, I wrestle at times with anxiety, and, 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 and it, it's kind of it's eerie when you read something and you realize they're talking about you. And it said that oftentimes people who have anxiety, they think that it allows them to control the future in some way, right? That if you, if you hold on to that fear, then nothing bad will happen. And it can become very easy to just love that feeling where, 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 strangely enough, fear and anxiety become almost a security blanket. Oh, I know this feeling. Okay, this makes me feel safe. So much so that when people say something else, like, no, 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 hey, it's going to be okay, or hey, there's peace, you just want to tell them to be quiet. In fact, that's what they want to do. Did you notice? What do they want to do to Joshua and Caleb, who have the gall to say, I think we can keep moving? They want to stone them. They want to kill them. That kind of fear and anxiety, as the Israelites, as this generation of Israelites ends up experiencing, lends, leads itself only, only to death. Now, I think it's helpful to know how fear and anxiety begin to, 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 to stress and to strain and to distort things. I also think it's really hard to stop especially when you're surrounded by people for whom it has become the norm just to be stressed and fearful. And even though you may want to, it's, it's not as easy as just having the willpower to just stop. I've noticed that oftentimes we, even as Christians, we, we, we tend to do a couple of things that we think, well, maybe this will be helpful. One of them is that we tend to think, okay, if this thing happens the way I want it to happen, then I'll stop being afraid. Then I'll stop being anxious. I just need this to happen. So, let's just give an example. If you've been on the Trump train, some of you are, then today is a very stressful day. I've seen it. I've seen my family. Those who are on the Trump train within my family, they are despondent. It's over. All is lost. They thought this was going to be the person. It's not. What, well, I guess God's done. If you're riding with Biden, oh, I saw it within my family. Great joy! Everything's going to be great now. Here's the problem. In about three and a half years, when another election comes, guess what you're going to be? Full of anxiety and fear. Every four years, it's going to come back up again. As long, as long as your fear and anxiety or lack thereof are dependent on any one thing, one event, one whatever it may be that is not Jesus Christ, you will continue in this cycle of fear and anxiety. The other thing I noticed is that people are really big into wanting to know how do I get over fear and anxiety in the, when, when they're right in the middle of that moment, in that moment of great fear and anxiety. And, and quite frankly, just to be honest, it's too late then. Because you've got to practice. You have to practice getting to that place. You can't just start. It's a little bit like, it's a little bit like showing up on a marathon. You wouldn't just show up on a marathon, right, marathon day, not having trained, and expect to do well. I have a friend who did that back when she was in college. She didn't walk for days. You wouldn't expect that. But some of us think, well, when I'm in the midst of this fear and anxiety, I should just be able to just flip a switch. I'll just trust in God today. No, you've got to practice this day in and day out. 
It's a muscle that begins to build. So let's talk about a couple things, just real quick, and then I, 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 I want to focus on one thing a little bit longer. One is, if you're struggling with this, just, just you, you, you've got to tune some things out and some people out. Right? What, what happens? The Israelites, they're surrounded by people, right, who are all of a sudden saying it's all lost. There's this hullabaloo, and, and, and there are these ten spies, and they're saying, no, we're, you know, they're giants. We're grasshoppers. The longer you listen to them, the more you will begin to believe that they are giants and you are a grasshopper. And if when you get done talking to one person and you've tried this several times, you feel more anxious or fearful, or you've been watching this thing or listening to that thing, and you keep getting more fearful and more anxious, shut it down. Shut it down. There's also, of course, and we talked about this a lot, just the focus on what the Lord has done for you. We already described that, what the Israelites could have done. They had to done. They had a decision to make at that moment as they stood there and they decided to focus on the fearful future rather than on the faithfulness of God. But the last thing I want us to think about here is verse 30. Verse 30, the people are losing their minds. Caleb quiets them. Now, Timothy Ashley says, well, yeah, I suppose that's kind of true, but here's the thing. Usually when this kind of language is used, it's really more than that. It's really more like there's this great cacophony as we see, and, and, and really more of what Caleb is doing, and I'm going to be very blunt here, and, uh, 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 and so forgive me, but really what Caleb is saying is this. He's saying, shut up! Just stop! Hush! I don't think he said hush. Shut your mouths! Stop talking. Stop screaming. Stop listening to each other. Stop listening to yourself right now. Be quiet. And listen for God. Be quiet. This is how you begin to grow in being able to be less anxious and less fearful. Not when all those fearful things are gone. They will always be there. Not when you decide on that day that that's when you should just stop fearing. But when you have begun to build up a practice and the muscle of being quiet. Earlier this week, I did a, a Zoom interview that I want you to see with a guy named Chris Evans. Chris Evans is a, a ZPC, or he's been here about four years. He's in my home group. I, I, he's going to hear this at some point, and so I hope he doesn't take this wrong. There's nothing special about Chris. He's a, he's a guy, I think he's in his mid 30s. He's got four kids. Uh, he doesn't have a seminary degree. He works from home right now. But over the last seven or eight months, uh, as he's been in our home group, we've, we've heard him kind of talk just a little bit about this, this spiritual transformation. It's not fireworks. It's just something that he's slowly begun to do that's begun to change him. So I just want us to watch this for about five minutes. So one of the things that we're talking about with, uh, with the story is the fact that, you know, amidst all the fears and anxieties that the spies were facing, that, um, that Caleb kind of told everyone to just be quiet and to hush. And I think a part of that is uh, in order to be able to experience kind of the presence of God in some way uh, or in a deeper way. Um, so why don't you, if you take both of those, how, is, how, how would meditating um, help you to be more aware kind of of the presence of God, and then how would journaling, how, how has journaling helped you to do that as well? So both of those. Um, I think something that made it click for me was just thinking of it, of it as prayer. Like it's basically, I am quieting my mind and training my mind to just be still. Um, and that is the spot where you can kind of tap into your uh, kind of deeper self, deep, you know, kind of for me, at least that's how I view like where I can, can, be in touch more with God is 
when things are a little more still. Um, it takes, for me, at least personally, it took a lot of training um, and just practicing meditation to get there. Um, I think I, I use uh, the Headspace app, which was super helpful, um, at least in terms of like getting the basics down and some techniques to kind of help you get to that spot. Um, because when you sit down to, to do, you know, I guess, you know, contemplation or silent prayer in that way, or meditation, we can call it, name it whatever we want. But like when you, when you sit down to do that in, in our world, your mind just immediately stop, starts racing and like to take some practice to get to the point where you feel like your mind is just kind of quiet and you're just sort of sitting there. Um, and that's sort of like kind of when you, um, there's just, I don't know, I, it's hard to like kind of explain all the benefits of that uh, out loud, but it, it just definitely helps like you calm, stay calm. Um, so how and, long, when yeah. you started this, Chris, how long did you, when you were at the beginning of this kind of trying to kind of quiet your mind um, in the presence of God, how long would you say you started? Did you start with doing it for two hours a day? No, or? no. I think if you can get, if you can get five or 10 minutes in, uh, to start, I think that's pretty good. And I think even now, like 15 or 20 minutes is probably like my average, um, for me right now, usually it's like a first thing in the morning thing. Um, uh, but I usually find myself like reading a devotional or something that like kind of get my mind or reading, you know, um, there for a while I was just going through Proverbs and like some, something, um, to get my mind, like not thinking about the day, but like just kind of focusing on God or what's God trying to teach me today. Um, and that kind of helps my mind not race as much in the morning. Um, yeah. And so yeah. how did, how did that meditation that you did in the morning, those 10, 15 minutes, how did you see that opening doors or helping you to see things differently through the day? I realize that might be a hard question to answer, but. Well, I think what happens is that like meditation is like a, it's like a training ground for the day in a way, like with your thoughts for me, at least, um, because you, you are, you know, one of the techniques with meditation is just noting. So like when you're sitting there and you're just quiet and you have these thoughts pop in your brain, it's just like noting that, okay, that's a thought. And this is like shoving it away. You know, that's a thought, shoving it away. And it, that if you think about how you go throughout your day and trying to be present, the same thing happens throughout the day. So like when, when you start to get better at that in your meditation, you start to notice you start to notice when your mind is wandering or like kind of going on autopilot or checking out versus being present. Mm -hmm. And when you are being present, you're for me, I keep saying you, this is all for me personally. I don't know how much this translates for other people, but it, I start to find myself noticing God in, in different ways um, because I'm being present versus kind of not, you know, being where my, where my feet are, so to speak. How do you, as you think through this, both the meditation and the journaling and kind of the paying attention, as you're saying, um, amidst all the kind of the challenges of this time, right, with COVID, uh, racial tension, elections, all of those, as well as just, you know, you know, having four kids at home, um, all those, and working from home. Um, how would you say? I mean, has this been helpful to you in any way in terms of kind of dealing with those fears or anxieties or or tensions or whatnot? Does that make sense? it's just like kind of more of like a longer the it's kind of like the long game you know in a way like you're like and there's you know i'm kind of almost playing this like growth mindset game with god throughout the day and kind of viewing almost maybe it's this maybe it's like almost viewing those really hard things that are happening in our world um that while well, they're not happening for me specifically, uh, obviously, um, they are. There are lessons embedded and buried in those, and in, in both how I, how I respond and react to them, and um, you know what, what's being, what's God trying to teach, what's God's intent to teach me through this. Like, what can I learn from this? And um, I think that is probably that, I don't know, just kind of that sort of posture on things versus um, getting getting really worked up and stressed about. It. I mean, honestly, the hardest thing really is, is your kids because um, it's just so, I mean, anybody who has kids, I'm sure can relate. It's just, it's very emotional and especially right now because um, you're around each other so much. Um, but 
you know, cause it's, it's just so easy to like, kind of just go into autopilot mode and get frustrated and get upset and not catch yourself. You know, that's kind of where that noting comes in that I talked about earlier. Um, yeah. So I think that it's, maybe it's that like, it's kind of what, what am I meant to learn from this? Yeah. What am I meant to learn from this? That's a beautiful, I love that ending. Now, obviously we didn't get to talk about journaling in there. Well, we did, but uh, it was gonna be too long. So Chris was also doing that. And w what I'm struck by though is the simplicity of this. The simplicity of simply saying, we're gonna create 15 minutes just to be still. And the fact that as Chris said, this has taken a long time, but it's not a magic pill. It doesn't happen overnight. But it's a commitment. It's a decision each and every day. And so here's what I want you to here's what I want you to know. I, I did some counting. Uh, I can count, and um, from Christmas back, forty days, which is how long they were in uh, how long that they were in uh, Canaan, starts next Sunday. So from next Sunday, it's only forty days to Christmas. Doesn't really feel like Christmas that much to me yet, but it does if you're at Costco. Here's what I want to encourage us, and I want you to start thinking about this now. To start thinking about, I'm going to, during those 40 days, I'm going to take this challenge for 15 minutes. Now, some of you already do this now. Some of you do this for hours, right? Ed Bunnell, usually two or three hours. I forget what you told me that you usually do, but for 15 minutes. So, so some of you, you're going to go longer than this, but for many of us, I have a sneaking suspicion. This may be a challenge that might be something new to us to just simply be. It's not easy. There's no perfect way to do it, but just simply be. And here's the challenge, to begin to note and to begin to wonder as you continue to do that, do you begin to see God more? Not just during those 15 minutes, but throughout the day. And as a part of that, does it not begin to help you to be a person who is more at peace? It doesn't change everything going on around you, but it just might help you to be able to be a person of peace in a season of great anxiety. Practice this week. Start with five minutes. Work your way up. And starting next Sunday, we're going to take 40 days to simply be in the presence of God and to see what difference that might make in our lives. Hallelujah. Amen? And let's pray. God, we pray that you would be with us even now. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit and your presence. And we pray that you would help us to be more mindful of that. Show us where you are. Show us how you are at work. That we might then be a people of peace. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Every song we could ever sing and Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring and Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside.
Please stand. Sisters and brothers, I want us to be able to be a peace, people of peace in the midst of peace or midst of fear and anxiety for you. But I also want to do it so that we can be witnesses to the world around us. A couple months ago now, I read this or read about this analogy that I thought was very helpful for me at least, and it was just talking about a lake. And if a lake wants to be able to reflect the sunshine clearly, then it needs to be calm. It can't be choppy. Otherwise, it just gets glimpses, but it's not very clear. And in the same way this person was saying, that's the way it is with our lives. If we want to reflect the Son of God clearly, then we need to be a people of peace, not a people of fear and anxiety and tumult. And that in so doing, then others might be drawn to the Prince of Peace. And so I encourage you to think about it this week, to start this next Sunday with just being still for 15 minutes in the presence of God. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and until Jesus returns. Hallelujah. Amen.